Good evening. Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Please let me know in the chat. Okay, okay, that's fine. All right. So I would like to apologize. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Please let me know in the Okay, so I'd like to apologize for the delay and the little network problems I had. I'm just going to go through the chat to see if you guys can hear me properly. Am I still audible? Am I still audible? Okay, that's fine. So I'd like to apologize once again for the little delay or the large delay rather. Welcome to 10 Days of Power BI. My name is Chinonso Konko, and I'm a data analyst with proficiency in Excel and Power BI. I know we started a little late, but I would still like to give a few minutes for people to join. Say five minutes. Let's see if other people can join us well and benefit from this. So the time right now is Time right now is 6.13 p.m. So we're going to wait for five minutes and then we're going to start.
All right. While we're waiting for others to join us, um, I would like to know where you're joining us from. So just drop it in the chat, boys, where you're joining us from. Yes, this is life. This is life. Okay. The class is just starting, guys. The class is just starting. One minute to go and then we're going to start. I think we've given enough time to let others join in as well. Okay, Abuja, Nigeria, Lagos, Nigeria. Okay, guys, I'm seeing. All right, I think we've waited enough. It's time to get started. So a little introduction. My name is Chinon Sokonko and I am a data analyst with proficiency in Excel, Python, and of course, Power BI. This is a 10 days of learning Power BI program. And I'm going to be the instructor for this program. I'll be assisted by Tina. Please, Tina, can you introduce yourself? Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Tina. I'm a data analyst. So basically, what I'll be doing, I'll be assisting on so in checking the live chat. So if you have any questions, you can just drop them in the live chat so as not to um, distract the teaching. You can drop, she'll be answering your questions at, at intervals because we intend to make this class a very, very interactive one. So please, just if you have any questions, just drop them in the chat for you do well to respond. Okay, guys. So let's start. This program will introduce you to the data analytics to Power BI and teach you how to generate insights and recommendations from data that can help make informed business decisions. At the end of this program, you would have learned how to Get data from a CSV or Excel file, transform data using Power Query, design a data model, and, creative interacti and create interactive Power BI dashboards to solve a business problem. Without further ado, let's get into it. This is day one. Okay, today's anti data analytics. This is a beginner friendly program. So we're going to go over the data analytics tools and processes. We are going to go over the core components of analytics and an introduction to Power BI. So today is just an intro session for beginners and everyone alike. So data analytics, 
Oh, uh, I think we have been hearing the word data analytics everywhere, or maybe popularly you have been hearing this phrase, data is the new oil, and we should all start drilling it. And you've been wondering exactly what exactly is going on, what's with this craze around going on about data. Data is basically a collection of information. Let's get to understand what data and data analytics mean. Data is basically a collection of information. And we all know that the right access to information can take you to the right places. Looking at companies like Microsoft and Google, these are companies that are doing well, doing great actually, and they leverage the power of data analytics to help them improve their service. Now, how exactly, I would like to just I would like to bring into this contest an example from it, an example that we usually face. Let's start with Netflix, for example. Netflix offers a recommendation system where you get Netflix is a streaming platform. You go on the app to stream movies and watch movies. And they also offer recommendations. They recommend movies for you to watch. How do you think Netflix is able to recommend movies, to make recommendations for you? This is done through analyzing the data from your search history and your watch history. And your recommendation is based on 80% of that data. Or let's take example, looking at Google, we go online and search things. Like recently, I searched for an item that I wanted to buy online. I searched for it on Google to check out images of it. And then I went on Twitter and Instagram, and I kept seeing this item coming up in my scroll feed, wondering, oh, how did this happen? The data from your, the data is collected and stored, and then it is brought up and kind of pushed into your face because they know this is what you're interested in. A very, um, a very interesting thing about me is I love football. Watching football, I've gotten to see how data analytics is also applied in football. When you watch football, say Chelsea and Arsenal is playing a match. You can, tell it clear, you can clearly tell in a match who has the most possession for most of the times at least. You can tell if Chelsea is doing well, which we do for most of the time. <laughs> so you can clearly tell if Chelsea is doing well. But you cannot exactly tell the amount of possession. But with data analytics, you see this pop up on your screen. Chelsea, 70% possession. Arsenal, 30% possession. And you wonder, how do they get these numbers? This is all data analytics at play. Or for instance, check your, have you, checked, have you tried checking your Twitter account or your WhatsApp group? Seeing that you can export your charts and be able to analyze this chart and understand the month you gain the most followers and you gain the most engagement or interaction on the platform. Data analytics is such a vast field and honestly, it's a very interesting field because you can apply it in anything that interests you, anything you're passionate about. You just pick a passion project to work in. And I think that's what I like about this industry. You can apply data analytics in virtually every industry. You can apply it in finance, you can apply it in banking. And if you want to, if you have a favorite, um, a favorite celebrity online, you can even apply it. You can go ahead and gather tweets online from your favorite celebrity and analyze to see when their album performed the best. Basically, what I'm just saying is starting a career in data analytics, you can get to start, starting from a new career, you can be able to easily pivot into data analytics. But getting into data analytics, it will be better if you, of course, have a business knowledge of the industry you're entering into. But if you don't, you can go ahead and research into it and understand it. Everything is a learning curve and a learning process. Don't know if you guys can still understand me and still hear me, but I'm moving on to the next slide. Yeah, I talked about the football analytics and the fact that you can use your Twitter account and WhatsApp group chat to analyze and get who is the most chatterbox 
in your WhatsApp, um, your WhatsApp group. You can easily go to your WhatsApp and export the feature, export your test rather, export the messages in your group chat and analyze who is the most. Should I use the word talkative? <laughs> or who is the chatty boss in your group chat and analyze which user has been dropping messages a lot in the group. Let's go into the definition of data analytics. I'll try to break it down so you'll be able to get what really matters here. Data analytics is the collection, analysis, and use of data to tell stories using charts and visualizations to help make informed business decisions. Now, this is a personal favorite definition of mine because it highlights the collection analysis and telling stories with data using visualizations. But there's one thing this definition misses out. Data analytics always starts with a business problem. You don't go ahead to collect data without having a business problem that you want to solve. Like, it's not possible. You just can't go ahead collecting data on something without knowing what exactly you're trying to solve. So you end up collecting the right data. So data analytics always start with a business problem you're trying to solve. Are you trying to understand your sales? Are you trying to find seasonal patterns in your sales? Are you an entrepreneur? You have a sales company and you want to understand what is going on in your sales? Or are you a Twitter user and you want to understand what is going on with your Twitter account? You want to understand how you can grow your followings based on what has been happening in the past years. So it starts with a business problem, the collection of data, the analysis of data and telling stories using charts and visualizations. Now, data analysis can be done with just sharing the numbers, but we find that using charts and visualizations makes it easy to pass information across. And in the end, the whole data analytics process ends when people are able to take these insights you have generated and make informed decisions that they can act on it to help their businesses. What is the OSS of collecting data, analyzing data, if you're not providing any recommendations for people to act on. It just seems like a waste, doesn't it? Okay, okay, let's move on. Let's talk about the data analytics tools. Now, since this course is created for Power BI, we will not delve deep into talking about all these tools. But I'll start off with, these are the basic tools that you need as a data analyst. These are the basic tools you need. You need the knowledge of Microsoft Excel, which is a spreadsheet language. You need the knowledge of SQL, which is structured query language. You need Power BI or Tableau. This is the visualization language. And then you need a programming language, Python or R. Starting a data analytics career, you don't necessarily need a programming language. You can do the most in your career and advance far without even having a programming language. But if you feel that you want to have an edge once you start applying for jobs, go ahead and learn Python. It's always going to come in handy. Now, Python, Excel, SQL, Power BI, and Tableau. Also, I'd like to point the fact that you should learn a skill to be able to use that data analytics too well. You can end up learning a lot of tools and not be able to use one effectively. And I feel that that puts you at a disadvantage. I've heard of people that got jobs just with the knowledge of Excel or with the knowledge of Power BI alone. And they got to grow on the job and learn on the job. You can learn all the tools, but you are a master of none. And I feel like that has nothing. Let's talk about the data analytics process now. Data analytics process starts with identifying the business question you like to answer. Now, I know <laughs> it might be getting a little tiring because I'm always repeating a business question, business question, a problem you're trying to solve or you're trying to answer. But this is the start. This is like the beginning of data analytics. This is round zero. You need to identify the business question you like to answer. Say you want to grow your Twitter following. So the business question is, you'd like to grow Twitter following. How can Twitter followers increase? Or say you have a business and you'd like to know when to stock up on certain products and when and which products to stock up on, rather. These are business questions you'd like to answer. You'd like to know 
What products are my best selling products? What products should I stock up on occasionally? And when should I stock up on this product? Uh, on these products rather, so that people don't come in and ask for them and I can't deliver. If you can't deliver products when people ask for them, you know what that means. They'll basically almost never come back. Now that we've gotten the first data analysis process, which is identifying the business problem you want to answer, we move on to the next, which is gathering the data you need to help answer the identified question. In a work setting, your stakeholder or your manager is going to walk up to you and tell you, oh, no, so we have a problem here. We want you to I uh, want you to understand, want you to analyze and check if there is a gender pay gap within our company. And then they're going to provide you with data sets that you can use to answer your questions. But as a beginner data analyst now starting out, you need to get experience working on projects. And this is where you're going to gather data from going on sites like cargo.com or data the world to get data sets that will help you to answer your identified question. So there's been a lot of discussion about maybe inflation or GDP or the COVID that happened. So once you have that business problem, you want to understand what is happening, it's about GDP. Then you go online and search for data sets. You gather data sets relating to that question. The next step is to clean the data to prepare it for analysis. Now this step is a very important step and I find that some people do not particularly find it interesting, but this step is very important because it can it can literally mar your analysis. Now, what does it mean to clean data? Am I saying data is dirty? What does it mean that data is dirty? Data comes in a we know human beings are the one entering data into the system for most of the time, and we are prone to errors. We are not perfect, make errors. Now, Dirty data is data that contains nulls, duplicates. I'll just start off with this few, and then when we delve further into data cleaning, we'll go deeper into this. So we are basing dirty data right now on nulls and duplicates. What are duplicates value? What exactly does it mean that I have duplicates in my data set? And by the way, data set is just a table. You have a regular table that's containing values of just let's say your name, your age or something, that's just data set. So now you have a data, a data that is dirty. You have, what, what exactly does duplicates mean? I would like to just bring a typical Nigerian school scenario into this. We say you have 100 students in a class. Let's say we have 100 students in a class and a class is ongoing and you're asked to all show up and take attendance. A student comes in, writes his matric number, writes his full name, and then ticks an attendance box. Then another student comes in and a friend of the student A, which is student B, comes in and writes student A, matric number, full name, and ticks the check box. At the end of the day, the data is collated and the number of students in the class seems to be 101. From this wrong information of 101, Decisions will be taken on this. If it's about making exam sheets available, 101 students, which is totally wrong. So in data, when we have these duplicates, we should identify these duplicates and remove them because they can break our analysis or mar our analysis. What are nulls? Nulls are basically missing values in, in your data. We know as human beings, we are... Some things are private to us. When we are asked to share information online, especially something like salary range, we tend to not have discussions about it. If you ask, input your salary range, and you see it's like, okay, it's optional. You're not going to put your salary range. So these are like kind of like missing values in your data set. When it comes to finding nodes or missing values, which is similar, which is the same name it's referred to, nodes or missing values. In data analysis process, I will always say it's like, it always depends. How do you undo nodes? How do you undo missing values? It always depends on the situation. You check your nodes. Is it too large? If it's like 2%, can I drop this null values? Depends on the analysis you're doing. And anything you take, let the stakeholder know what is going on. Let them know that, okay, I had to do this. There's a limitation to my analysis because a certain population, a certain this um, didn't provide this information. So say we have gotten our data clean and ready and we've prepared it for analysis. We go to the next stage, which is to analyze the data. Now, this is basically where you start 
you put forth a question and you try to check your data and see if your data can answer the question. Let me use the Twitter scenario I'm asking. So you put forth an hypothesis that if you tweet, tweeting much can gain you more followers. That is an hypothesis you put. You're not sure if there is really a correlation between that. But you put it forth and then you say, okay, let me try to check that. You get data from your Twitter account. And you check the month, your tweets per month, and the amount of followers. You try to analyze that and see what happens. Whatever comes forth, you will tell that, okay, yes, there is indeed a correlation with the amount of tweets I'm tweeting per month and the amount of followers I'm gaining per month. Now, interpreting the results of your analysis is basically, oh, yes, tweets are tweets per month, as tweets I'm tweeting in a month increases, so also does my followers increase. So I interpret this result to mean there's a correlation between my um, the tweets I'm making in a month and the amount of followers I'm gaining. If I want to become a Twitter influencer, then I need to start tweeting more. This is where also you provide recommendations for a business. Let's say a business is experiencing sales and you notice that Every month, every particular like Saturday of the month, or let's say every particular Monday of the month, there are low sales in that month. You are inside that there might be a business problem affecting that. You go ahead and look for that insight to answer why is there a low sales in this month, and then you provide a recommendation based on your findings. I hope you guys are getting me. I don't know if I'm being a little fast or I don't know if I'm being a little fast, but I hope you're able to get me. So I will just try to go over this again. I mean, you identify the business problem you'd like to answer. You gather the data set. You need to answer the identify question. You clean the data. You analyze the data and you interpret the results of your analysis. So the data analysis process always starts with the business question, like I said earlier. And... All of this. Mm. Let's go ahead and talk about oh oh I'm going so fast. Okay, okay. I think that's <laughs> that's one fourth of mine. I tend to like just speak and go too fast. I'll just try to slow down and take you guys along. So um, I also give room for questions. So maybe when I give room for questions, you can tell me the parts that you feel like you missed out on because I was moving a little too fast. So maybe I should go back this again. I said you identify the business question you like to answer which is you want to solve sales problem, you want to identify the seasonal trends in your sales company, or you want to identify how followers, how you can gain more followers. Next, you gather the data set that you need to help answer the identified questions. If it's a sales business problem, you would get the sales data. But if it's a Twitter follower, business problem you're trying to solve, you would have to um, get Twitter data. Then you clean this data because you can't go ahead and analyze your data. You have to prepare it first. You clean the data by removing duplicates and by removing nodes to prepare it for the next stage, which is the analyzing stage, where you analyze your data and then you interpret the results of your analysis. I think I think I did well with my pace here. Yeah, I tried to like slow down a little bit, but let's just go on. Let's take a little bit pause because of my pace. And let's, let's try to identify your questions. Keep your questions coming in. Let's know. Okay. Um, it seems... Uh, when I spoke earlier on, a couple of persons didn't hear me. So um, I, what I was saying earlier on, I said, my name is Tina, I'm a data analyst as well. And I'm in a comment session taking down your questions. So if you have any questions um, at intervals, you'll be taking a pause to answer those questions so that 
we can carry everyone along because we intend to make this class a very, very interactive one. So um, one of the questions that I picked out from the, um, from the live chat, somebody is asking how excellent should we be in all this? And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm guessing you mean the tools. And um, I'll just let Nonso answer that first. Yes, I'll take that question. I'll take that question. How excellent should you be in all these tools? Now, starting out as a beginner or entry level data analyst, you don't need to know all these tools. That's what I started with. You don't need to know all these tools. But I say you start out with learning one tool. And once you start out with learning one tool, it's best you understand the tool. And how do you, when you go ahead and you take courses online and you take lessons online, how do you identify if you've actually understood this concept, if you actually understand the tool you're using? Say you're learning Power BI. This is when actually you work on a project. When you work on a data project, you're able to identify your gaps. So you're asking me how you would get to be, um, how you know these skills. So know this. Okay, let me get the question again. How excellent should we be in all this? So as a data analyst, you just, as, a, as an entry data analyst, rather, you just need to just start with one tool and familiarize yourself with the tool. Work on projects. Work on projects that make you stand out. When you work on projects that make you stand out and you can get a foot in the door with just a data analytics tool. But then when you start off with learning one, you can as well add another to your bracket. But imagine you're being known for, okay, this person is known for Power BI. Anytime there's a Power BI conversation, they bring your name up. Every time there's a conversation about Excel, who's very good with Excel, who would I call if I had a problem with Excel? You come first. So basically, just focus on one tool first. And when you feel you have a good understanding of the tool, go ahead and take a project. And when you're done with that, you can move ahead to learning another tool. Okay, so we'll be taking one more question before we continue. So um, somebody is asking, um, with, this, um, with the data tools, did you say SQL is quite important? Mm, SQL is important. I would not say SQL is not important. But I've, said, I've seen people that have gotten jobs just with knowledge of Excel and Power BI. I've seen people that had no knowledge of SQL, like, with, and they got a job. Even Tina is an example. She got a job with just a knowledge of Python and Power BI. She got a data analyst job. So you learning SQL is of course useful for data analytics, but starting out, you don't want to overwhelm yourself with a lot of things. So you start out with one tool and then you progress. I don't know if that answer is quite helpful. Okay, so um, should we take a little break? Should we take a five minutes or a 10 minutes break? Or do you think we should continue? What do you guys think? Let me know. You want to take like a water break for like five minutes or say 10 minutes and then we come back to this or should I move ahead? Should I go on? Just let me know in the chat box. Let me know. So I can see your chats, I can see your messages. I think you guys think we should continue, we should move on, we should go on. So of course we will be moving on. The core components of analytics. 
Now, I know we have been going over a lot and a lot of theory concepts, and <laughs> but this is just a beginner class, so you need to understand what data analytics means first before we go right into it. So I apologize for all the theory and theory, but it's like required. So to start off with, the core components of analytics, we have descriptive analytics, diagnostic analytics, predictive analytics, and prescriptive analytics. So I'm going to take this one after each other and try to break it down because I really don't like big words too. And I want things explained to me in simpler terms. So let's start off with descriptive analytics. As the name kind of implies, descriptive is like to describe. So basically, descriptive analytics is tells of the story of what happened in your data. What happened? You're giving a data. What happened is basically saying which product, let's say you're analyzing a product data, top five products by sales, like which products are the best selling products? That's you telling what happened in the company's data in the year since 2021. You're describing what happened. Also, you have a toy sales data set and you're trying to analyze, uh, you're trying to describe what happened. Well, let me use a better, let me use a better example. Let's use and let's use an employee data. So a manager comes to you and tells you like he wants you to analyze like the HR um, the employee data to tell him because he suspects that there is a gender pay gap going on and he suspects that there might be like more males than females in the department, in the company overall. So basically it gives you this data and you start off with descriptive analytics to understand what is going on. Okay, what is the amount of females in this department, what's the amount of males, what's the, what's the distribution of females in a particular department and males, and then you're trying to analyze what's the average or median salary that if that females earn com uh, and compared to their male counterparts. So this is basically describing what is happening in that data set. Or a sales data, for example, let's say you're an employer or or you're an entrepreneur rather, you have a business, you get your data set, you get your data from your business, your sales data, and you try to analyze it. And you see that in the month of say April, you experience low sales. That's what happened. Then we move on to the diagnostic analytics. So diagnostic analysis is answering the questions why. Now you know what happened. But why did this happen? Why were sales low in this month? This is when you also start putting forth like hypotheses or like questions like, okay, sales, you look at your data set and you look for a particular variable or an attribute that will be able to answer the question. If you remember my Twitter follower example I, I used, it's just like you're looking at, okay, followers, okay, I gained followers in this month, I gained less followers in this month, then why did I gain more followers in this month? Then you put forth an hypothesis that, okay, it might be because I'm, it might be because of the number of tweets. And then you check it, try to see if that is really possible. So you're trying to diagnose the problem. You're trying to understand why it happened. Or let's say sales, you're not selling a particular month. You're trying to understand why are you not making sales in that month? Is it because that month is, let's say, a cold? Let's say during that month, it's usually cold and you have a bike. You have a bike renting system and people don't want to ride when it's cold or people want to ride when it's cold. Just something like that. Then let's go to the next, which is predictive analytics. Now, predictive, you're trying to predict what is going to happen in the future. Now, it's all sweet and it's all good to know what is happening now and be able to handle the issues you're facing in your data, be able to handle, um, be able to make recommendations. But it's also good to be able to tell what can happen in the future so you can kind of like prevent that from happening, you can kind of like take, take inputs now, like take actions now before that happens. So you've been experiencing employers, um, employees rather, leaving your company. You analyze the data set of employee and you see that from 20, let's say 2019 to 2020, um, the, the total number of employees reduced, 2020 to 2021, the total number of employees reduced as well, with 
And with this analytics, you can be able to clearly tell that in the next year, based on the data set you have and based on analyzing certain qualities, you can be able to tell that, oh, there's a probability that employer, um, employees are going to leave. But the only way you can able to do this is tell me why are they leaving? That's your diagnostic phase. Why? Okay, employees are leaving. And then now you want to predict what's going to happen in the future. Are more employees going to leave? So why are employees leaving? Are they leaving because you're not offering them enough paycheck or you're not offering them um, vacations or you're not giving them paid leave? So this is what you used to check. Okay, the number of employees that are, the number the employees that left the company, what are your attributes? Were they being paid well? You check your data set. Do they have, were they paid were they paid well? Do they have paid leave and vacations? And then this, the next step is prescriptive analysis. This is when you're prescribing a solution to a problem, like you're a doctor prescribing a dose to a patient. This is when you're actually stating your insights and prescribing a solution or making a recommendation to your stakeholder or your manager. Now, a stakeholder or your manager is someone that is involved in a business problem that is direct. It's basically like your manager that you report to. So these are just some of the co these are just some of the components of analytics: descriptive, diagnostic, predictive, and prescriptive. So I'll go over it again. Descriptive is just telling you what happened in your data. You're just this is just you're just starting in, you're just diving into the data and saying, okay, let me start. Let me see the number of products I'm selling. You're just starting out. Then diagnostic is when you're delving a little bit deep. Okay, why did this thing I found in descriptive? Why did it happen? And predictive is trying to say, okay, what is going to happen in the future? And prescriptive, you're trying to make a recommendation based on what you've seen from your data. Let's move on. Moving on to the next or let's before we move on okay so um before we move on there are a lot of questions so i would just um, want us to allow non so finish what she asked for us today and when it gets to q and a sessions we'll be going over the questions so we can finish up what we have for today Okay, now so says she wants to answer one question. So um I'll be asking the next question, I think. Um, the next question here is how do we analyze Twitter followers? How do we analyze Twitter followers? Uh, I know you are not going to like to hear about this, <laughs> but it has to be said you will need Python. You probably need Python to do this. And you probably need Python to gather the data. So you need to use Python to gather the data. And if you are a newbie, you probably will still need to take courses to learn how to do that. But I've been hearing discussion about using Power Automate to get data from Twitter, but I've not actually tried it out. Um, I was reading an article about it one day, and I think I saw a limit to it, but I'm not sure, so don't take my words for it. But basically, what I would tell you is, when I do Twitter analysis, I have to use Python to get the data from Twitter. You have to use Python. now. But WhatsApp analysis is quite simple, because WhatsApp, you just need to export your chat. Your chat is going to come out in like a text format, or a CSV format, I think. So for Twitter data, you might need knowledge of Python to gather your data. Or if you don't have one, you could ask someone to help you gather the data or to just do a quick session to you on how to gather data from Twitter. You can just do that, a quick session. How do I use Python to gather data from Twitter? You can just have someone to do that for you. Now, we all know social media is... Social media is like the new wave. It's like the new thing. Everyone is on social media. Everyone is using social media. At least everyone. So analyzing um, Twitter, analyzing Twitter data or Instagram data is will be very good for any business you work in. So 
add that ability would be very good. I hope I've been able to like answer your question. And I'm sorry I had to mention Python, but you you would just let you just like Python when you get to know it. So I think I've answered your question. Let's um let's move on to the next. We'll still have a little Q and A at the end of the class, so just stay tuned till then. Yay! We have gotten to Power BI. Now we are discussing about Power BI. Power BI is a data analytics and a business intelligence tool that converts data from different data sources, interactive dashboards, and Power BI, which is BI reports. Basically, Power BI offers you the feature of getting data from different sources. We might have a little knowledge about Excel, so you can be able to get data from an Excel workbook using Power BI. If you know about SQL, you can, able, you can be able to get data using from a SQL server, and also, you can get data from CSV file. You can get data that is stored in your folder in your computer as well. Basically, what is the difference between just Power BI and Excel? I find that Excel has a limit of the number of rows of data it can allow. So the best tool, the business intelligence tool that can allow you to handle that is Power BI for you. It is a Microsoft product, Power BI, and it can enable you to convert data from different sources to interactive dashboards and BI reports. Power BI is a data, it's not just a data analytics tool as well, it's also a data visualization tool and a business intelligence tool. Now, a lot of the topics coming up with Power BI is, Power BI is not just a visualization tool, it's not just a visualization tool, and I absolutely agree with you. And I think why this discussion is coming up is because a lot of times when we use Power BI to design reports, which in our next class, or very soon I'm going to show you some reports. When we use Power BI to design reports, we tend to sometimes forget the fact of the data analysis and we tend to go for beauty and graphics. And now while having a good report that looks fine and the graphics and the graphics is good, it's also important that you're clearly communicating an information that your stakeholder needs and can understand to solve their problem. So that's why the topic of Power BI is not a business, it's not just a visualization tool. And Power BI, with Power BI, you can get your data in and start your data analytics process from start to finish, from getting your data to transform your data, cleaning it, analyzing it, and producing reports. It can do all of this for you. And you can also share your reports online with other people to use, to see, to view. Moving on, Power BI has three components. Now, the Power BI desktop. The Power BI desktop is what we are going to be using for this class. So we are going to be using the Power BI desktop. And the Power BI desktop is like an offline app, which is what you should have downloaded on your system. This was a prerequisite to this course. You need to have this on your laptop. Now, I would like to give you a tip, but it's not really a tip, I see, but Power BI desktop needs to run on a system that has a large or a fast processing speed. So you're going to notice sometimes that Power BI takes a while to load, and that is because of your system. Now, when we're starting data analytics, no one tells us that we need to get a very good system because of Power BI. But now I'm telling you this, if you need to get a system, you probably want to check specifications online. The next is the Power BI service. Now, Power BI Desktop is where you create your, it's where you analyze your data and then you create your report. And this report is shared to an online service. I repeat, the report you create on Power BI Desktop, you can publish it to an online service, which is called Power BI Service. Now, Power BI Service is an online service. Power BI Service also offers the feature of Power BI Desktop, like you can also view your reports here and interact with your reports in Power BI Service as well. 
So when you publish a report from Power BI to Excel to a Power BI service, you can easily get, you can get the code to embed this report that is in your Power BI service on your website. So starting out as a data analysis, I've been mentioning about how you have a project and a portfolio. So you might need to host this on your website. So with Power BI service, you can embed this report that you have created to solve a problem on that website. When you, you create your you create your report in Power BI desktop and then, oh, okay, there's a bit of a problem here. This screen is just lagging a little bit. So as I was saying, you create your report in Power BI desktop and then share it to Power BI service. Okay, is it rich? Okay. This is where we are. Apologies. So you create a report in your Power BI, you analyze your data, you create a report in Power BI desktop, and then you publish it to an online service, which is Power BI service. With Power BI service, you can generate an embed code. Um, when you create reports, I would probably just do a short session of how to do that. I'm sorry, my system seems to be having a slight git glitch. That's been happening for a while, and I was not expecting this to happen today. Can I get the mouse? Sorry, my system is glitching and we try so that. I think so. I think it's okay now. I think the system is okay now. So sorry for the breakthrough transmission. <laughs> So let's move on. So I started with Power BI desktop and I said you publish it to Power BI service. Okay, what is this again? So it's fine now, it's okay now. So you publish the Power BI service and then you can embed your report in a website. Power BI also offers you a mobile app which you can download on Google Play Store or on your iPhone App Store. So basically the three components of Power BI is the Power BI desktop, the Power BI service, and the Power BI mobile. Moving on. Now, since we have discussed about data analytics and we've discussed about um, Power BI, we've gotten a, to know a little bit about these two things. We're wondering how to perform data analytics in Power BI. I'm so sorry that this keeps happening. It's just my system has slight issues. So to perform data analytics in Power BI, you will need to understand the business problem. Here we go again, understanding the business problem. I'm always going to emphasize that. And then you need to understand the business industry you're analyzing. Understanding the business industry you're analyzing is so that you can be able to know which information actually matters to present to them. But my screen is going blank. Okay. Okay. 
to perform data analytics, let me just start over again. To perform data analysis in Power BI, you need to understand the business problem and the business industry you're analyzing. Why do you need to understand the business industry you're analyzing? So you can be able to make what, what is I'd like to apologize for the break. My laptop had glitch glitches, so I'll be moving on now. To perform data analytics in Power BI, you need to understand the business problem and the business industry you're analyzing. You need to know the certain factors that are important in the business industry you're analyzing. Say you're um, analyzing um, a company data about customers, they believe customers are living. You would need to know, you need to have a metric, like the churn rate, the rate at which customers are leaving. You need to have it in your report because this is something that the business stakeholder would really value, would really like to know. So if you understand the business problem you're solving and you have, um, you have um, knowledge in the business industry analyzing, you need to be skilled in data preparation data modeling, DAX functions, and data visualizations. Now, you need to know how to prepare your data and you need to know, how to, you need to know data modeling. Data modeling is basically creating relationships between your data tables. When we get into data modeling, we'll go deeper into that. DAX functions are data analysis functions. They're basically functions that you write to create measures and calculated columns. Now, I know a lot of these concepts might be similarly little bit strange and for a beginner but when we go on i would make sure i explain each of them and then you need to be skilled with data visualizations so let's go to power bi before we enter this section before we start this journey let's go to power bi and understand the interface of power bi I'm going to Power BI right now. So it's coming up. Okay. So when you open the Power BI desktop, the first thing you see is this little pop-up window here. Maybe not so little, but the first thing you see is this pop-up window. You're just going to come over here. You're just going to need to come over to the edge and close that. And you see another pop-up. This is just for... If you've started using Power BI already, you're not basically going to see this if you start out as a beginner. You just, so I'm just going to close this pop up right now. So, so let's go into explaining all of these skills you've seen. 
I'm going to expand all of this because you might see it in your first time opening Power BI. Okay, so seeing all of this, when you come into Power BI, this is the interface you are presented with. You. So we're going to go over this from like the right to the left. You come from, coming from here, first thing you start off is you see, coming from the left to the right rather, you see your file, your home tab, your insert tab, your modeling tab, and your view tab. So now the default, you're going to be, you're going to see your home tab here. From your home tab, you can see this little icon here telling you to get data. And then when you click on it, you can see connect data from multiple sources. So that is what Power BI offers. You can connect the data from so many sources as well. You see Excel workbook. So this was made easy. So you can get data here from different sources, but yeah, you just click on it and you get data from Excel workbook direct. You can see a lot of other sources, SQL Server, like I mentioned, and then you can see it. You can see under the ribbons here queries to transform data. Basically, when you open Power BI, you, it comes up with this pane first, containing your tabs, moving from left to right. Then let's go up to the left-hand side here, where you're seeing these icons, these three icons here. If you notice, you can see a little orange or yellow icon. This means this is the tab we're in. So this, um, this is the view we're in. This is three views that Power BI offers. Power BI offers three views. This is the report view. The first the report view is the view we are on, guys. You can see here they're telling you add data to your report. If you check here, add data to your report. So we are in the report view. Then when we come here, this is our data view. So we don't have any data in yet. So that's why we cannot see any data. But if we have gotten data from the get data, we're going to see our data table here. Then you come into the third one. This is your model view. This is where, if you have more than one tables, as you can see, there's a little bit of graphics here to help you understand that this is a table connected to this table, connected to this table and the other tables as well. So this is your data model tab. This is where you basically establish relationships between tables. So here we're going to talk about one-to-many relationships. We're going to talk about cardinality. When we when we delve into data modeling, we'll talk about it. We'll talk about why data modeling matters, how you're going to have different, how you're going to have data from different sources, and you probably need to connect your data tables together. So I've explained that we have the report view, which is the default view. So once you open your Power BI, you see your report view. And then the next is the data view. And the last is the model, the data model. So I repeat again, we have the report view, we have the data view, and we have your data model right here. So now that we have that, let's move back to the default view. When you move to this side, when you move to the right side, you see this filter here. Basically, let's say you have a data containing of containing rather males and females, and you just want to analyze only the female population. This is where you can be able to put your gender and filter to show only female population. So most of the times you might need to just make this close this filter here to make it to so expand the tab you work with. And then when you need to filter, you can expand that as well. Or you can just work with it. Then next, you see your visualization pane. So we have started with the filters pane, we're going to the visualizations pane, and then we also have our fields pane as well. So these are like three panes. They're called like panes. They're kind of like, should I call it like a layout? It's called like P-A-N-E-S, panes. So we have filters pane, we have visualizations pane, and we have fields pane. So in visualization pane, this is basically where you select the virtuals that you're going to use to 
just to visit your data. Now we're going to go deep into understanding which visuals you're going to choose. When do you choose a stack bar chart? When you do you choose an horizontal chart? When do you choose an area chart? When do you use a card visual? We're just going to go into this. And then if you notice something, there's a little three tiny dots down underneath. I don't know why my mouse is lagging a little bit. Okay, so this is get more visuals. You can clearly see that. So from this button, if you feel, which I sometimes feel that there's not enough visuals that I want to use to tell my story sometimes, I can clearly come here and click on get more visuals and it takes me to the marketplace. But we'll just be starting off with the default visuals for now. And then let's move to our field pane. Now our field pane is where our data is contained. Basically, data is stored in rows and columns. If you know what a table is, if you have seen it, <laughs> or clearly seen a table. <laughs> so basically, you have a table. A table consists of rows and columns. So you can also call a column a field. So this field, this field pane is going to contain your data table. And then you can, when you, clearly it's going to contain your data table when you enter data into it. So it's not showing anything yet because I haven't loaded any data. So many things I'm going to see the column headers here of my data tables. Okay, I think maybe I should just talk about these values under our visualizations. You can see add data fields here. So this is basically where I pick from my data fields here and I'm going to drop here to build visuals. So if I do not select any visualization and I pick a field and I add to these values, what I'm going to get is going to be a table. But if I choose to select a card visual first, it's going to come onto my canvas. That is something I should mention. This is your canvas. This canvas is basically like the canvas of a painter. This is where all your reports are going to be on. So once I put a card visual here, it will appear on my canvas, and then I'll get data from my fields, and I will drag that to my values, or I will just tick a checkbox. This is just an intro. When we start data cleaning and data visualization, you get to see what I mean. But I'm just trying to introduce you to how, this, how the Power BI interface looks. So now we have talked about the tabs here. We see on the file, the home, the insert tabs, and the view tab. We've talked about the views, which we can find on this left-hand side, which is the, I'll repeat again, the report view, the data tables, and data view, rather. Data view, which contains your data tables, and then your model, your model view, or your data model. And we've talked about the three panes which we have here on the right hand side. You have your filters, you have your visualizations, and you have your field pane. So now there's also something you might have noticed looking at this interface. You have noticed this is a page one. So you can also add more pages if you want. Look at this little plus icon stating new page. So I can just click on this and then I have a page two. I can click on it and create more page pages if I need. Why do we get more than one pages in this? Now, this is where it come, we come to talk about um, visualizations. You know, we can use, we use Power BI to create visualizations. Now, visualizations are charts as well. Using Power BI, you create like, there's this, online, there's this discussion between what is dashboard and what is report. A dashboard is still a report, but a dashboard is just a one page report. So when you have more than one page, you are basically building a report. But when you have just one page, you have a dashboard. I don't know if that makes sense. Let me try to go over it again. Just having one page of your data. This is my canvas. I designed a canvas on just page two. And uh, let me say on just page one, page two is not available. I delete page two. Like, see, if you save this report, probably I will permanently delete it. You want to delete this page? I do. So I create a report on just page one and I share online. That is a dashboard. It is a one page report. But if I create more than one pages, of reports which I share online. Now that is a report. 
So pages, you can give page pages descriptive names like let's say this page of a data you're just focusing on sales. You can click on it, right click and select rename page and you can edit the name to be sales. Is that going to help you understand better? You can rename your um, your page names. You can do that. Okay, I'm seeing in the chat box um, to come again with the dashboards and report. So I said, I'm always saying what's the difference between the dashboard and what's the difference between the report. The dashboard is basically you trying to like tell your story in just a single page. You're trying to tell your tell your story, tell your data story in just a single page. So the difference between a dashboard and a report is a dashboard is just a single page and then a report is like, more than one page a dashboard is still a report you can still call a dashboard a report but it's just a one page report does that make sense i think i think i, I think that's explanation enough okay let's go over the getting data let me show you something Common data sources. You can get Excel workbook, you have Power BI data sets, and let's just come to text and CSV. You're mostly going to be importing data from text to CSV files online. Let's click here more. Let's get to see more about this. Mm, Power BI, of course, taking your taking time to load. Stop Power BI again. When you come here, your all you can see your Excel workbook, you can see text here, CXV, XML, JSON, you can get data from JSON, you can get data from a folder. So if you store your Excel workbook in a folder, you need to come to a folder to get your data from it. And then once that is done, you connect to the data source. So I'm just going to cancel that. So you can get data from here. Or you can also come to your file and you can choose to get data from here as well. You see this little icon here. This is just to save your file. So you can click on this every time to save your file or you can just hit Ctrl S when you're done creating your report. And then Power BI offers you this, the undo and the redo. So your last action, if you ended up changing something in your data report and you want to undo that, you can just come here and click and voila, you just undo the last action. So under the home tab, you have the data. This is where you get your data from. You have the queries. This is where you transform your data. This is where we're going to talk about the use of Power Query Editor. Power Query, Edi Power Query Editor now is a it comes with Power BI. It's like a data transformation tool that comes with Power BI Desktop. It is very, very helpful for data transformations, for data cleaning. The Power Query, you can do a lot. And I think, yeah, not I think, Power Query also comes with Excel. So if you have knowledge of Excel, when it comes to Power Query, it's going to be easy to understand. But if you don't, I'm still going to make it easy to understand. I'll try to make it easy to understand. Power Query as well. So should we go over this again from the beginning? When you come into the Power BI interface, the first thing you want to do obviously is to get your data. So you come here and you get your data from here. You get the data you want. If your data comes in a CSV format, you get the data. And then you go to the left hand side, you see three views. You see your reports view, you see your data view, and you see your model view. So these three views are going to be important to you. These three views are important. This transform data, your queries, are, is also important because you might always need to go back to transform your data during the process of analysis. So you need to know this. So here is where when your data is loaded, you can see it in tables. Clearly, you're not seeing anything now because we have no data loaded. And I said, yeah, it's where you come and create your relationships between tables. And relationship between tables is created based on a primary identification, based on a primary ID. This is basically 
the identification that this table shares and the other table shares is just like if you can use like a product ID for example. Let's not delve deep into that. This is just an introduction. We don't want to get overwhelmed. So I've talked about the tabs, which you see. I've talked about the three views. I've talked about the canvas, where you create your report. And then the three panes, which are the filter panes, the visualizations, and the field panes. Power BI also offers mobile layout, like you can lay out your dashboard in the way you want to see it in mobile devices. So if you remember when I explained Power BI components, I said we have Power BI desktop, we have Power BI service, and we have Power BI mobile. So if you create a dashboard in your, in your laptop, please, so... I'm hearing from Tina that from the chat box that you guys want me to go over the interface again. Okay, I will explain that. Let me let me let me just finish with this. Okay, I think I speak a little too fast. I'm going to try to slow it down. I'll slow it down. So let's go right from the beginning. Let's take it from the top, guys. When you open the Power BI desktop, the first thing you see is a pop-up box, which you come over to, and you're going to just close it. So you're not seeing that pop-up box here because it's already opened. But you're going to see like a yellow pop-up box, and you see an X, you just click on it, and you close it. That's the first. Going from left to right, let's try to understand the interface work. Okay, I think it's getting better. So this is just going to help you to know what it means. So at the first time I'm using Power BI, you're just going to try to overround things and to see what it means. And if you use it with time, within a week, you will get used to this interface. So as you can see, I'm hovering over this. I call this the tabs, and I'm calling this the views. So we have the tabs, we have the views. And I say we have three views. We have report view, we have report view, we have the data view, and we have the data model. And I said the default view, meaning the view when you open the Power BI interface is the report view. You can see a, I'm not sure you can really see, but there's like an orange, a slight orange at the edge, which is showing you like this is the view we are currently in. After talking about the views, I went on to the three pins, which is the filters pin, visualizations pin, and of course our fields pin. So I said the filters is basically what the name does it filters your data to only certain attributes that you need? I said if you have male and female and you just only want to see the female of your population, you can take the gender from your field pane, place it in your let me let me expand this so you can see what I'm saying. You can pick something from here and add the data field here to filter. Then you can come to your visualization pins. Visualization pins. See the, see the little overing, so it's helping you to understand. You're seeing this is a stack bar chart. You're seeing this is a stack column chart. You're seeing this is a line chart. So if you're looking for anything, you can just over around it onto, you get used to it that when you come over to visualizations, you just go directly to your card visual. You know where it is. Next class, we're going to start off with getting data and cleaning data or transforming data using Power Query. So I've talked about the filters pane, the visualization pane, and the field pane, guys. I hope you guys are paying attention. I hope, I hope I'm being explanatory enough. I really do. And then the last thing I talked about were the pages. Where I said, just adding this plus icon, you can create as many pages as you want. Now, see, I'm in page one. I can go to page two and page three. And then I talked about this white, this white background is like your canvas. Basically, a painter paints on like a canvas, and you as a data analyst and a data visualization expert, you're going to put your chart here on a canvas as well. So 
I think we should try. I think I should go through the chat to get questions. Is there any question that? Is there any question from the group chat on the chat? So we've come to the end of today's section, and we're just going to be having a little Q and A session to see if there is anything you need further clarifications on. So Tina would speak now. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, just confirm you can hear me. Um, thank you very much for sticking to the end. I know everybody has been waiting for this moment. Um, so I'll be going over the questions. Meanwhile, we're going to share the slides with you, but if you um, fill the pre-assessment form that was shared in the group, because we're only going to be sharing the slides with those that fill the pre-assessment form. So um, I'll just be going over a couple of questions. Um, the first question here is, which branch of data analytics has more, has more job opportunities? I like this question. I definitely do like this question because this person shows that they want to have an edge that I don't want to go into a field where I will not find job easily. Even though you're learning data analysis, data analytics and you enjoy it, obviously you want a job that you can earn money from. We all want to earn the money. Basically, I'll still tell you to always go into the industry that you have passion for. But since we're talking about job opportunities here, I would say you should delve into the areas that you feel are not, you feel are not, um, you feel data analysts have, have not, have not exactly entered into. For instance, let's talk about sports analytics now. Sports analytics is not something that you see everywhere. As a data analyst, you can get into sports analytics. I don't know, so you can get signed by Chelsea, Arsenal, or your favorite football club. But all of this is not just going to happen overnight. You need to put in the work. And you need to create um, projects that shows the impact that you can bring to a club. I recently read an article where they talked about how to select players. They have a data analyst, Edward. Edward. I can't really remember his surname, but the discussion was just they don't select players just from their recent in, um, their recent performance. The data analyst will go through the player's performance history to select them. So before I digress from your question, which is which branch of data analysis has more job opportunities, you, as I told you, you can work in any, you can work in any industry, you can work in finance, you can work in anything. Basically, job opportunities are out there. The only thing is, are you skilled enough? Do you have data? There are there's discussions that the data analyst industry is crowded, but yet we still see people getting the job. So you just need to stand out. You need to have a project that makes you stand out from the rest. You need to work on something as well that makes you stand out from the rest and include that in your portfolio. That is that is what I can still call for now. I hope that answers your question. Okay, another question here. Somebody said, do people analyze Facebook and Instagram data? Yes, yes, they do. Facebook and Instagram data. But you might not see a lot of resources online to help you understand how to do this. It might take you a while to understand. And I think that's the thing with data projects. They don't just happen overnight. You sit down with this project, you start with the project idea, you're thinking of how you're going to do this, how you're going to get the data. So it, don't, it doesn't just happen overnight. But if you connect with a lot of data professionals that have probably done this, you can go to their GitHub, look through their codes or something, or you can just speak to them and ask them, oh, I saw you did this Instagram analysis of this. I would like to know how to do this. But so I don't think that's it. But you can analyze Instagram and um, Facebook data. Okay, so the next question is, is it a must to know Excel before getting a job with Power BI? No, it is not a must. Now, what people generally advise you is to start out with Excel. But I would like to give an example of Tina. Tina is a data analyst. She's working at um, a data company, Fanban. Tina got her first job without the knowledge of Excel. Her first data project she did was just with Power BI. Because Tina's major, Tina's major goal is to become a data scientist. So she started off with the Python and then to visualize her results, she went on to Power BI. So she got her first job just with 
Power BI and Power BI and of course Python. So I'll tell you as a data analyst, it doesn't really matter the tool. It's about what you can do with that data analytics tool. So you don't need to know Excel before Python, but people will always advise one to start out with Excel. And why you get this advice is because people feel like it's easier to learn Excel because Excel is just tables which you can see. And so when you start data analytics, they don't want you to get scared and discouraged. But there's also discussions about Excel being used in the workplace. But will you get a job if you know Power BI? Definitely. You don't need to have Excel to learn Power BI. Okay, so there's another question here. There's no version for Mac. Can Tableau work for this class? Okay, I'll be answering this one. No, this is um, a Power BI class. So Tableau cannot work for this class. And I think um, somebody shared a link on how you can get the version of Mac. Maybe I'll look for that in the Telegram group and share that again. Another question here is, is it possible to get a job through the knowledge of Power BI alone? Definitely. You just need to put in the work. There are BI analysts that specialize in using Power BI. In the end, I'll still bring it. It's your project that count. What can you bring? The, the business industry doesn't really care about tools per se. What can you bring to their team? If they see your work online and they can see that, oh, this work can really help my team, or this project shows me this person's capabilities. Yes, of course they will hire you. But once you get on the job, you probably need to learn other tools as well. You need to learn SQL so you can query data from database. You need to grow on the job. But starting out, you just need to get a foot in the door. You need to start out with one tool. So yes, you can get a job with just Power BI alone. You can even start out freelancing with Power BI. Okay, so somebody is asking, can I use R instead of Python to get data from Twitter? Definitely, definitely. It's just my personal favorite is Python, so I, I got to say Python and Python alone, but of course you can use R. R and Python offers the same. Okay, somebody is asking another question. I downloaded the Power BI via the link shared by the admin. I have a Microsoft account, but when I try to log in it, it says I can't do so with my personal account. Okay. Um, Power BI doesn't allow you to do so with just your personal email account. You have to get like a work email. So basically, it's not really a work email per se. You just need to create a Microsoft 365 account. You can just go ahead and check that. Go, to, go on YouTube and search. I'm sure you... That's how I was able to set up my own starting out. I'm going to tell you that you should visit YouTube a lot. You're going to see videos. There's so many amazing people on YouTube that are making content just to help us. So you're going to see a video showing you how to set up your Microsoft 365 account there you get a, an email that like at on microsoft.com or something like that and you're going to use it to start up your email you're going to use it to start up your power bi so basically the question to answer is you can go on youtube and search out to create a microsoft 365 account to get like an email okay i hope, so, I hope that was explanation enough okay so the next question is is there a career in being a consultant for data analytics rather than working primarily under a company yes yes i <laughs> there's this discussion of wanting to be your own boss and working to, and wanting to work under somebody so yes there's definitely a career in consultancy you can have you can have contract jobs you can also consult for people like recently i Valley made an um I really made a post of people that are good at creating Power BI visuals and you get it, but the pay was quite nice for an entry level role. So basically she was saying the data is going to be clean and you get to analyze it. So if you're on Twitter, you know Ivy Valley. So she made that okay. an account. Okay, so the next question is, if I'm working on a month on month data, can I use one page for each month? Um, You can definitely do that, but then... When you're working on a month on month data, sometimes you might want to. No, definitely you can use that for each month. It's when you get to a year by year basis that you might want to compare a particular year sales and by the other. Like for for sales by year, this is when we typically use like something called a line chart to like show the trend. So you might want to be able to see a trend. Like a trend is basically like. like typical like an arrow moving i want to see the arrow is moving for this year there's a spike here there's a down the data depends on the situation you analyze it 
And I know the answer is not very helpful, but it actually just depends. Okay, another question. Does Power BI have any limits to page creation? Not that I know of, but I don't think you're going to be creating a lot of pages that you're going to face that problem. Yeah, so I don't think that you're going to create a, a, a lot of pages, so I don't think you're going to encounter that. I mean, how many pages do you want to create? But that's an interesting question, though. That's an interesting question. Okay, so the next question, if I'm making an investment report of a year, which will be completed monthly, am I to use a page for each month and the summary too? Okay, let me see. Okay, I think I'll just leave that Tina to answer that. Okay, so um, your question, if you're making an investment report of a year, which will be computed monthly, you're asking if you have to use a page for each month and the summary too. Well, it all depends on um, it all depends on the person you are presenting this data and what you're trying to show in this data. You can decide to use um, a month and you can decide to use a page um, to show each month. If you want to maybe like be very explicit of the month and you're showing like, okay, maybe weekly in that month, you can decide to do that. But you can also decide to show all of this in just a one page report. Do you understand? So you can also decide to show this in just a one page report and just show, okay, this is a month on month. Um, you're showing a report for a year. So you can do January, February, this thing, just maybe using a line chart or something like that. Probably when you guys go into practical and all of that, you'll be understanding all of all these things very well. Okay, somebody's asking, can we have a data practice today? Okay, about that question, I just wanted to do an intro. Okay, you can perform data transformation and data cleaning using Power Query. So I'm sorry, Brian, the, the session is even almost at an end, so we won't be having a data practice today, but definitely it is for tomorrow. You can go through the class schedule, of course, to also see how we structured out the content but for today we won't be having a data practice i'm so sorry but tomorrow we definitely will start getting our hands to the data we're going to get data we're going to start cleaning data and i'm going to send you one to work with because you can't just be watching me work on data and then at the end you don't get to practice your own as well you have to practice that's the only way you can get better and we can all get better so i think that answers the question Thank you. Okay, somebody is asking which is more user friendly between Excel and Power BI. User friendly, definitely Excel, definitely Excel, definitely Excel, because you can clearly start off with like your data tables that you can see clearly. I think that's why people always say start out with Excel, start out with Excel. But I found that I don't like the limitation of Excel. Excel comes with the limitation of about one million rows of data, so it can work for you as a beginner data analyst, but I recently completed the Google Data Analytics course where we had like over 5 million rows of data. And I would have been able to do that with Excel still yet, but I would not have been able, I think I'm going a little bit deep, but let me just explain that. I would not have been able to see the physical data table and I didn't particularly enjoy that process. So I feel like with Power BI, I would enjoy creating a report that is like over 5 million rows or very large. If you're working in some job settings, your data sets, people are selling, people are selling products every day. They're working for big companies. Data, there's talk of big data. Data is quite large. Every day we are creating data. We're making videos online. We're posting pictures online. We're writing tweets. Everything is just data. So definitely Excel is beginner friendly, but Power BI as well. It's not easy to think I started out learning Power BI and I got to love Power, I got to love Power BI. So Power BI is definitely also beginner friendly as well, but then Excel is a little bit more beginner friendly. So I think that answers it. Okay, um, the next question is, um, I have a question about creating portfolios for a data analyst. Which one is better, GitHub or Medium or something else? Okay, I'll answer this one. So um, for portfolio as a data analyst, it depends on what kind of documentation you are um, presenting. Now, there are many, and there are all of all this one-page portfolio, like um, sites, you can just create your portfolio online. But if you are doing more, if you're using Python for your data analysis, it would be nice to have a GitHub um, account to document all of your codes and all of that up there. 
But for a um, for somebody who has a lot of visualizations and you want people to see that, it would be nice to have a medium article. Med I, I recommend medium for any data analyst or data scientist. Medium is very, very important because um, when recruiters actually reach out to you, they want to see your thought process. They want to see, oh, what was this person thinking when this person decided to embark on this project, especially as a beginner. They want to um, know if you can actually um, find out, discover problems as a data analyst. So it's nice when you can do your um, documentation on Medium. So regardless of having a one-page portfolio where you can put all of your um, dashboards and all that, or a GitHub account where you can put your um, code, it's highly recommended you have a Medium account where you can document your projects. Like just do a little, a, a little thought process of how this project how you worked on this project and um, what the project, what you found out from your findings from the project. She has already talked about the data processing. So this is all you are just putting on your Medium page. I hope this answers your question. Okay, I think that's good. I'll just, uh, I'll just add to that. So the Medium activity, let's say we work on a project together. And if I want to share that alone, and that will be okay. We got the data. The data was in a CSV format. You can share about the number of rows and the number of columns you have in your data or something like that. You can do a little description of what each column entails in your Medium article. You can then write about how you went about removing duplicates to ensure that your analysis was correct. This is just you basically having um, explaining to um, a recruiter how you go about the whole data process and helping them to really trust that they can trust your process in handling their data sets. So I think that has been covered. Okay, so we're getting um, to the end of this session. Um, thank you to everybody that stayed till the end. Um, I hope that you guys actually enjoyed the class and you guys gained something from it. We'll be sharing a form to just um, to gauge your um, knowledge on today's class and also to um, ask for your feedback on how today's class was. Please would appreciate every feedback we can get because it would help us to plan this class better. Also, would like you to tweet about today's class because there's something I always say. When you don't share your journey, your there's no journey. way, when you don't share your learning journey, there's no way um, recruiters or people that are actually interested to work with you will see you. So even if you are um, building amazing dashboards, building, um, you're, you're very, very smart. It's always nice to come out and share with people. You don't know who you might be helping. So you can just tweet, make, make a post, just tweet about today's class, what you learned and how you feel about today's class. You can use the hashtag 10 days of Power BI with none. So I'll be looking forward to seeing everybody's tweet. And we're going to be retweeting and all of that. So please, if you have any questions as well, um, uh, we'll be sharing our um, LinkedIn profile and our Twitter profile in the group. So you can always send a message or you can always tweet at us. We'll answer every question. So um, this, the time now is, the time now is um, 7.51. Um, it's a, it's a two hour class actually. So I hope you guys gained a lot. Um, we'll be ending the class for today. Yeah, I will just um, ask Nosso if she has anything to say. Nosso, do you have anything to say? Okay, I think she has said, um, said a lot and she said everything. She covered everything basically. That's nice and uh, that's cool. So basically, if you just tweet about it, you can use hashtag 10 days of Power BI. If you like me, you can use hashtag 10 days of Power BI. So that would be cool. But still, just basically, what I want you to do is to share your learning journey online because I believe sharing your learning journey will help you get people to take notice of you and take notice of the fact that, oh, this person started out learning Power BI from this, from like maybe ground, one, ground zero rather, and look at where they have come. So I can definitely trust this person with my work or with my project. So sharing your journey online, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, it cannot be overemphasized. Don't just sit and learn alone without sharing your journey online. That is a big no, you. So um, I think that's all for today. I want to say thank you for being with me, even though I had issues earlier signing in and everything. So I really appreciate that. And the most important thing is I hope you gain something from today's um, from today's lecture because um, that's the whole point of everything. If you learn something, that's good and that's fine for me. So I really appreciate everyone that tuned in, everyone that joined this. It's amazing. Um, I hope you guys get to get good with Power BI and just go viral. Just thank you for today's session.
And before I go on and on and start talking and talking, we're just going to try to round up today's session and we're going to send a link, as Sina earlier said. So the link is going to assess you based on what I've taught today and probably going to ask for your feedback on how today's session went. So also you can tweet about what you learned from today's session. Just pick one thing or two things you learned. Oh, you learned something about data model, you learned something about data analytics. So anything, just tweet it online. I would really appreciate that as well. So thank you very much. Okay, so I've dropped Nonso's um, Twitter account and mine. So you can just tweet at us and um, put uh, just mention us. We're going to be retweeting and all of that. But please, it will be important if you can share your journey, share what you learned, just one thing you picked out from today's session and share it online. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody, for joining in. Um, we hope to see you tomorrow by this time. And if you have any questions, don't forget to drop that um to uh, put that uh, to send that send us a message and all of that. We're going to be responding to you. Too. So it's good night. So from thank, this end. So thank you. Just please do not forget to fill out the form on your um, on assessing you for today. We're going to send the link to the telegram group. We're going to be doing that probably in the next 10 minutes or so. So you can just go through it and fill it. I hope you guys do well on it, but still it's just a learning process. There's room for growth and everything. So thank you very much for tuning in and that is the end of today's session. It was really a nice class. Thank you very much, guys. So this, this is the end. I'm just going to... So thank you very much once again. I'm going to be ending this. The recordings will be made available. All right. Make sure you join tomorrow's session as well. You don't miss any so that you don't have a gap in your lane. So thank you and good night.